Hello and welcome to the National Secular Society podcast. I'm Emma Park and this week I'll be talking to Alistair Lichton, the NSS's Education Officer, and Megan Manson, the Campaigns Officer. In the first half of this podcast, we'll be looking at Operation Christmas Child and how a seemingly innocuous appeal to send toys to developing countries is being exploited by Christian evangelists. Later in the show, I'll be speaking to Alistair about why 20,000 primary and secondary school children are being sent to faith schools, despite their parents preferring non-faith schools. Do you remember filling shoeboxes with toys when you were at school to be sent to children in developing countries? I certainly do. Many schools, youth groups and others have been taking part in this well-meaning practice for years at Christmas time. But did you know that the organisation behind Operation Christmas Child is an evangelical Christian charity called Samaritan's Purse? This organisation seems to be using the shoeboxes as, in effect, a bribe to persuade children to attend its religious programme. As their website puts it, After receiving a shoebox gift, children have the opportunity to enrol in The Greatest Journey, 12 fun and interactive Bible lessons where they get the chance to discover who Jesus is and how to begin their own journey of faith. The website also states that operating with, quote, communities in need in sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, Samaritan's Purse describes itself in its mission statement as, quote, a non-denominational evangelical Christian organization that helps to meet needs of people who are victims of war, poverty, natural disasters, disease and famine with the purpose of sharing God's love through his son, Jesus Christ, end of quote. In other words, as with many religious charities, laudable motives of helping people in distress are mingled with the more problematic aim of proselytizing and converting people to the version of Christianity which they espouse. And in the case of Samaritan's Purse, this seems to be a fairly dogmatic, if not fundamentalist, version. The Statement of Faith on the charity's website asserts, among other things in the same vein, that, quote, we believe that for the salvation of lost and sinful man, repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ result in regeneration by the Holy Spirit and that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, end of quote. Under current English law, Samaritan's Purse is entitled to have charitable status with the concomitant tax relief and other benefits that this brings. This is because the advancement of religion is a recognised charitable purpose. In the 21st century, in a society in which around half of the population is non-religious, is this situation justifiable? I'm joined now by Megan Manson and Alistair Lichten to discuss these issues further. Megan and Alistair, hello. Hi. Megan, first, are the schools and other organisations who send shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child aware of the evangelical purpose for which they're being used? Not necessarily. Um, So Operation Christmas Child has grown more transparent about what they do. And their website actually explains it in quite a lot of detail. But of course, the thing is, not everyone who participates in the scheme reads the website or uh, their leaflets. In the cases of schools... Parents simply find out that they have to help their child fill a box of toys and that box will go to children in an impoverished country. And they'll understandably take that at face value. Because on the surface, it seems like a nice thing to do and a good way to teach children about the importance of generosity and civil responsibility. A few of those parents are going to think to question it. They probably wouldn't even imagine that those toys will be used as part of a religious missionary scheme. What are the National Secular Society's objections to the scheme? Well, the main objection we have is that it's unethical and exploitative. Um, So primarily it's exploiting children and families in poor countries by putting them under pressure to convert to fundamentalist Christianity. It's hard to say no to people who come bearing gifts, uh, especially for one's children. Uh, Many critics have pointed out that the scheme smacks of colonialism. And it exploits children and families in rich countries too. Uh, It uses their generosity as a tool for religious conversion. Um, Once they find out how the shoeboxes are being used, many participants are rightly horrified. They never wish to be used as the unwitting agent in uh, religious propaganda. 
And there are other considerations as well. We have to think about the environmental impact of flying tons of plastic toys across the world every year. And then there's the potential impact on the local economy. Um, how are local vendors trying to sell their own products supposed to compete with a multi-million pound scheme with this aggressive agenda and these free handouts? And then finally, there's the ineffectiveness of it all. Uh, filling shoeboxes with plastic trinkets to send overseas is a really inefficient way to give to charity. Uh, monetary donations are far more effective for really helping people. You mention on your blog that some religious charities are less objectionable because they follow third sector best practice. Could you explain what this means and how is it that Samaritan's Purse are failing to follow third sector best practice? Reputable charities providing aid in developing countries, um, they're well aware and they understand the sensitivity involved in such activities and they work to ensure that human rights and dignity is central to their work. For example, equality is a key part of this work. Um, aid must be distributed equally and fairly. But with Operation Christmas Child, children get random boxes with different things inside. And inevitably, some children get more toys or better toys than others, uh, which could stir up tension. Um, the many organisations, including international aid charities, have expressed their concerns about Operation Christmas Child. Uh, Brendan Paddy of Save the Children has criticised the scheme and said it is dangerous when charities mix humanitarian work with the promotion of a particular religious or political agenda. Does the National Secular Society think Operation Christmas Child ought to be abandoned altogether? Wouldn't that be a bit harsh on children in developing countries who might be looking forward to a Christmas present? Well, firstly, it's worth pointing out that many of the communities targeted by Operation Christmas Child don't even celebrate Christmas. Uh, the charity targets majority Muslim areas, uh, which makes sense, because the whole idea of the programme is to turn non-Christians into Christians. When we look um, who's behind uh, the Samaritan's Purse charity, we can understand just why this is so insidious. The president of Samaritan's Purse is American missionary Franklin Graham, who is the son of the former notorious televangelist Billy Graham. Franklin Graham has some alarming views, uh, including when it comes to Muslims. He is supportive of banning Muslims from entering the US, and he has helped uh, propagate the conspiracy theory that Barack Obama is a secret Muslim. Bearing this in mind, his suitability as a figurehead of aid work in Islamic countries is, well, questionable to say the least. Samaritan's Purse does do other work, but its resources are dominated by this Operation Christmas Child initiative. So let's take a look at its finances. Um, it's got an income of over 15.9 million um, as of 2018, which means it's one of the richest uh, charities in the country. And last year it spent under £400,000 on emergency responses, uh, £1.4 million on long-term development, just over £51,000 on other activities, um, over £230,000 on their Greatest Journey Indoctrination Programme, and then a whopping £13 million on Operation Christmas Child. In other words, Samaritan's Purse spends far more of its donations on Operation Christmas Child and the related indoctrination programmes than anything else. If Samaritan's Purse is serious about genuinely making a positive difference to the lives of children in developing countries, it would make sense to ditch the Operation Christmas Child scheme and focus more on aid work with no religious strings attached. What does the National Secular Society propose should be done with the money that would otherwise go to the shoeboxes? Well, giving to charity is a personal choice at the end of the day. So whether or not one should partake in a particular charitable activity is entirely up to the individual. The same applies to Operation Christmas Child, but we want to make sure that before parents and schools decide to contribute to this project, they are aware of exactly what will happen when they take part so they can make an informed choice. We've uh, made a few suggestions on our website about alternative appeals to Operation Christmas Child. Uh, they include Oxfam Unwrapped and uh, Plan UK's Sponsor a Child programme. We also have information for parents and others whose school, club or other organisations are taking part in Operation Christmas Child and what they can do to raise objections. Now, moving on to the wider issue of charitable uses of religion, where in the laws of England and Wales does it say that advancement of religion is a charitable purpose? So this is all determined by the... Uh, Charity Law, the Charities Act um, 2011, which lists 13 
sort of different purposes a charity can have. And advancement of religion is one of those. Um, this this um, purpose, advancement of religion, has been part of charity law in various forms for a very long time, pretty much sort of as long as charities have been around. So is it time to legislate to stop the advancement of religion being a charitable purpose? Is it right that Christian and other religious organisations should have to pay taxes for the work they do, even if it involves helping people in distress? Well, we think it really is now the time to remove uh, the advancement of religion from the list of charitable purposes. The many religious charities out there that do provide a genuine public benefit and do help people would have no difficulty in registering under a different charitable purpose. So, for example, a Christian charity that does overseas aid work could list under relief of poverty. But organisations that exist solely to promote religious ideology with no apparent tangible public benefit should not be entitled to all the tax breaks and other benefits that charity status confers. So removing the advancement of religion as a charitable purpose would ensure all charities are treated equally and they're all held to the same high standard, uh, regardless of their particular religious ethos. Alistair, do you have anything to add? No, I think that really covers it quite well. I'll, I'll just say, and again, uh, a plug uh, Megan's blog, which will be linked in the show notes. That does, and the links to the other material that we have. Um, this is the sixth year that I've dealt with, or you know, had inquiries about Operation Christmas Child. And I'll just say to, you know, if this is going on in your school, this is actually an area where I've seen schools and organizations which have done operation christmas child do actually respond it's possible to be constructive on this because uh, you might not necessarily be, if if your school is committed to doing operation christmas child this year they may not necessarily abandon it abandon it uh, this uh, coming year because that may have made the arrangements uh, but if you bring this information to school's attention and actually you know show the very clear information that's out there i think a lot of schools you know we'll just take a look at it and go actually yeah no sorry we didn't know enough about this uh, well you know if we want to do some sort of charitable thing around uh christmas then we're we'll look into something that's you know more ethical uh, more effective uh, more educational megan and alistair thank you very much thank you Before we move on to our next topic, we wanted to share with you a couple of clips from the recent Bradlaugh Lecture 2019, delivered by Andrew Moffat and entitled No Outsiders Reclaiming Radical Ideas in Schools. Andrew is an assistant head teacher who encountered fierce opposition when he tried to teach about equality and diversity in his primary school in Birmingham. Here's Andrew. So I'm going to show you some of the books that we use, and, uh, and this is one of them. So you'll be forgiven for thinking, for looking at the uh, you know, various MPs uh, and, uh, and protesters, that all the books are all about gay people. So, so I'm going to show you the books that I use, not all of them, there's 35 books that I use, but uh, I based the whole uh, uh, scheme on this book, actually. I think this book is absolutely brilliant. It starts the whole scheme off. Red Rockets and Rainbow Jelly, and, it's, and I use this with four-year-olds, and it's about Nick and Sue. There's Nick and there's Sue, and Nick likes... Uh, red apples and she likes uh, green pears and he likes yellow socks and she likes yellow ducks and he likes orange hair, she likes purple hair. On every page, Nick and Sue like, they like different things. So cats and hats and cars and dinosaurs and jelly. But the last page says that um, Nick likes Sue and Sue likes Nick and that's the end of the story. So what's the message in that story? The message is that you can like different things and you can still be friends. It's as simple as that. And as we grow through our school, we talk about how we're different. You know, different skin, different abilities, different faith. But it all starts with apples and pears with four-year-olds. And there's a bit of work there from a four-year-old. We like different things. And Naya likes dolls and Samaya likes cars. We're all friends. There's a, and there, those are all the books that I'm using with four-year-olds. You know, bless him, Roger Got Godsiff, uh, MP, talked about this book called Why Is Gotcha Gay? I've never heard of that book. You know, I mean, apparently that's in my scheme. No, it's not. Uh, these are all the books in my scheme. You can all buy, buy them all in Waterstones. You'll notice that Elmer is there. Elmer's been around school for 30 years, you know. Um, these are the books that I am using. Now, there is one book there which is apparently controversial, which is uh, Mummy, Mama and Me. So I use this one for four-year-olds because I want, some, I want children to understand that there are some families have 
different makeup. So some partners have a mum and a dad, some have just a mum, some have just a dad, some have live with their grandpa, grandma or grandpa, some have two mums, some have two dads, some live in a foster family, all families are different. So we've been doing this for four years and it's worked fantastically. So what went wrong? In October last year, the uh, government uh, put out consultation for new RSE guidelines, Relationship and Sexual Education. And it's right they did that because it's been 18 years since the last, um, the last one. And um, lots of rumours started spreading around about what this would mean for sex education in schools. And there's a really interesting video on YouTube. We can look it up, Dr. Kate Godfrey Fawcett. I'm sure she won't mind me plugging her. A parent came to me in December and said, Mr. Moffat, you've got to watch this video. Everyone's talking about it. It's going around the community like wildfire. And I watched it. I actually watched it on Christmas Eve. It ruined my Christmas. Because, it, it, because it is, it, on the left-hand side is, it is what this video is saying. It's saying that the new RSC guidelines are, are going to be like this kind of stuff teaching four-year-olds pornography, sexualizing young children, their innocence is going to be destroyed, it's a war on spirituality, it's a war on morality, if we do nothing, our children will be lost, and it's brainwashing children. Now, um, suddenly, in January, the first week back, we started having petitions for the first time ever, that no outsiders, about sexualizing children. You're sexualizing children. And, and, and the photocopies of some of the books that I use, you know, and very, very quickly, people are linking no outsiders to sex education. Now, there's no sex in no outsiders. There's no books about how babies are made. There's no naked bodies. There's nothing at all. But because I talk about LGBT people in four of the books, four out of 35, it's a very easy thing to pick on. Look, here's an example of what's going to be happening in all schools. A full video of all of the Bradlaw lectures given so far is available now and will be in the programme notes. I'm now going to be talking to Alistair about the latest data about faith schools which the National Secular Society has obtained from the Department for Education through a Freedom of Information request. Alistair, could you explain what questions you asked in your FOI request and what information you obtained? Oh, thanks, Emma. So, uh, the first thing to note is these figures are for England only. We think there are similar issues elsewhere in the UK, but just the way the data works uh, meant that it had to be an English-only focus. And that these are, update, these are updated figures. Uh, so, we did similar FOI requests in 2017 and 2018, and they formed a significant part of our major report on this, uh, which was published in December, called The Choice Delusion, which really looked at how faith schools undermine uh, choice for many parents in England. Um, these figures, so ba the, ba the basic question, which we, we've now asked for the third year in a row, is how many children were assigned a faith school after their parents requested a non-faith school? And the figures show, uh, for the second year in a row, a rise. So it's just over 20,600. That includes uh, over 12,000 children sent to secondary faith schools, uh, despite uh, parental preference for, non -faith for a non-faith school, and just over 8,000 sent to primary uh, schools against their parent primary faith schools against their parents' preferences. Uh, now, I think it's important to note right at the beginning that these figures aren't definitive but they add to the evidence showing the many problems with the faith, with the faith school uh, choice narrative. What is that faith school choice narrative? Well, it's the number one justification given by many people for why we have um, faith-based schools is that they promote choice. And, you know, this is one of the things we encounter, we encounter when creating the, the No More Faith Schools campaign is to say faith schools support choice does kind of make a bit of an intrinsic sense and actually unpacking that and showing why that's kind of a flawed way of looking at it, it you, know, you can't say that in five seconds you've got to bring in data you've got to you know unpack the you know the various hidden assumptions in that how many of the parents in this report that you're talking about put a faith school as their second choice uh, we don't actually have the exact data on how many put a uh, faith school as their second choice. Um, parents, uh, depending on which area they live in, can make three to six choices. I think five is a, is a quite typical number. 
Uh, we know that over 4,300 people in September 2019, that's the, where these figures are from, were assigned faith schools uh, despite uh, no faith schools being anywhere in their preferences. And again, it's, it's, these, it's important to kind of unpack uh, the uh, data behind, uh, behind these figures and to consider why some people might make the choice of a faith school within, say, their six choices, despite not actually wanting a faith school. Uh, uh, I've certainly dealt with casework with parents who say, well, we were assigned, we really, really didn't want a faith school. We didn't get into any of our non-faith schools. We were assigned this um, C of E school that was our third choice. And it's like, well, why did you put it as a third choice? Many parents think, you know, if, they, if you have the option for six choices that you need to put them all in, uh, parents might say, oh, you know, I really don't want this faith school, but I definitely don't want a school that's five, six miles away. Equally, parents may put uh, a faith school as a, one of their choices because they just don't have any other options. You know, if you have one school in the village, your choices are pretty limited, and that's the uh, that's kind of uh, one of the other side other side of the story that we uh, we uh, went through in the choice delusion report. Is there any possibility that, um, say, parents might want to send their children to a faith school, but? There, there weren't any faith schools in the area. Yeah, I mean, equally, we, 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 can, we can look at that. We can look at that data. So there will be, um, within, within the you know, 20,600, there's going to be, obviously, uh, some anomalies either way. There will be many people who put a faith school despite not wanting one. And there will, I'm sure, be some parents who want a faith school but haven't put one as options. Uh, the difference in funding for transport to faith schools means that if a parent absolutely positively wants a faith school even if it's nowhere near their nearest school it's quite a long way away they can generally speaking put that as a preference and they're likely to get it if they meet the faith-based criteria and you know even if it means going past six suitable uh, non-faith schools the council will probably cover the transport for that but that doesn't apply if a parent wants a non-faith school uh, in practice no what are the national secular society's main objections to the fact that parents are often effectively forced to send their children to faith schools well i think our, our main objection is it that it, there's sort of this perverse thing that you hear all the time about faith schools promote choice faith schools promote choice and that ignores all people who have no choice but a faith school or are not able to choose their local school because of religious discrimination and admissions um you have the right to raise your children in accordance with your beliefs now, that doesn't entitle you to a faith school, but it certainly should entice you to a school that doesn't go against your, go against your religious beliefs. Um, in the Choice Delusion report, we had around, I think, 30 short stories and case studies, and parents are saying things like, you know, we're not a religious family. So if you are a religious family and you send your child to a faith school and they're reinforcing that belief, that belief that's fine. If you don't share those beliefs, then you, as a parent, having to, you know, how do you, do you actively counter? How do you deal with your child being taken you know, to school and taught something which goes you know, very much against your very fundamental values? And that's an experience that just doesn't happen for if your child is sent to a non-faith school, a community ethos school, a religiously non-directive school. No uh, child is sent to a uh, to a community school or shouldn't be and taught that their beliefs that you know that they're raising their family are wrong you know having that sort of striving for a neutral inclusive atmosphere doesn't disadvantage anyone in that in that same way so the point you're making is that non-faith schools do not impose a particular um, direction on children whereas faith schools do Yes, and obviously they vary. They they vary to the degree to which they impose that uh, faith direction. But non-faith schools aren't imposing. You know, they're not. They're not imposing non-faith. <laughs> it's uh, the idea that faith and non-faith are opposites. Are kind of a bit of a weird. Well, actually, that faith is one end of the scale. There's no other end of the scale, and you've got community for schools in the middle. Yeah, because they're simply with no faith. There's simply nothing to be imposed. How far are parents really concerned about sending their children to a faith school? Do you have any specific data or feedback on this issue? Well, it's an area of um, growing, growing concern as 
uh, partly as the country becomes much more religiously diverse and uh, and increasingly non-religious, and obviously parents uh, will tend to be uh, towards the younger end of the population, their children obviously even younger. So this is an age group that are overwhelmingly increasingly likely to be uh, non-religious, to not have religion as part of their life, and don't expect religion to be a central part of any other public service which they which they wish to access um we've featured uh, dozens of you know i think it's around 30 case studies and short stories in in the report of people in this position um uh, it's something that regularly comes up in comments in response to our uh, faith schools petition uh, so yes it's clear it, it's clearly an issue that affects many people and even if you take you know the very smallest end of the scale in these figures this is i think around uh, 4300 uh, people's who have put all of their choices as non-faith schools, you know, which kind of would seem to indicate that they want to, their parents want a non-faith school. Uh, thousands of children, possibly tens of thousands, being sent to faith schools against their wishes. Tens of thousands more with you know, maybe no other choice. This is a serious, serious issue that is just not being grappled with. Could you just say very quickly a bit about the Choice Delusion Report? Yeah, so this these th uh, these figures should be seen, I think, as an update. Uh, these are the 2019 figures, and the Choice Delusion report looked at the 2017 and uh, 2018 figures. Uh, Choice Delusion report, I think, it was pretty groundbreaking because we the, the government have been asked over the years, uh, various times by different uh, MPs, you know. Do you have an estimate of how many people don't have a choice about a faith school? Do you have an estimate of how many are sent to uh, faith schools against their parents' wishes? And the government just haven't made any estimates. So you know the the NSS analysing these gets you know the research went into choice decisions. What was the first of its type of any sort of scale to estimate and you know to pretty, a pretty good estimate of what the figures are. And you know the anal the analysis we've done now for the third year running on this showing it's a problem affecting tens of thousands of families, not being done by other organisations, certainly not being done by the government. So moving from the statistics to the practice, how far in practice do faith schools really impose a particular re religion on students from a non-religious background? Um, this is something that varies quite widely. And I never as an anti-faith school campaigner sit and pretend that all faith schools are you know nine to five indoctrination centers no one pretends it's all schools to that sort of level everyone acknowledges there is a wide range of practice and in terms of how aggressively this religious ethos is promoted in schools but faith schools all exist to promote a religious ethos and they all do it to some extent um there's a term indoctrination, which I think can put some people off and be all, you know, scare, scary word. But I, I think of it as sort of a scale. You've got inculcation, immersion and indoctrination. And inculcation is sort of that softer pushing, guiding people towards a, 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 relig a, a religious ethos or at least a positive view of religion. And this idea of faith schools have of immersion. So... Um, faith schools you know, may not be trying to turn children into members of that faith, but they're trying to create this idea that the world is a very religious world and surround them, immerse them in these religious ideas to make what you know is just not normal for most families. Not saying anything wrong with it, but just isn't the normal experience of, of the vast majority of people in the country, this sort of very religious community, and trying to make that seem as if that's normal. Um, the C often C of E uh, schools um, in the past were not seen as particularly uh, faith promotional. Uh, so, so often you saw C of E schools, uh, faith schools, were kind of uh, you know, faith schools by sort of a historical accident. But there's definitely been, in recent years, an increased focus on uh, promoting the faith within those schools. Do you have any particular examples? Yes, yeah, so uh, we've got case studies uh, and some of the testimonials on a No More uh, Faith School site from uh, teachers, governors at um, C of E faith schools about you know how there's the pressure to... Uh, promote a, a religious ethos. I see it a lot in the a lot in the casework, um, particularly we've got uh, examples anything from collective worship, etc. That parents might say, "Oh, you know, we went. This was the only school in the village. It was a C of E faith school." 
um, you know, we went, oh, I went to a C of E faith school when I was younger, didn't seem very religious. I was actually surprised by just how uh, religious, it, religious it is. Um, you know, I've chatted about this sometimes with my wife, but she attended a C of E faith school that was in some ways less religious than my community school. Um, which, well, the harm of this ethos being promoted often and i think the C of E in particular they they don't really believe that people are non-religious there's this sort of refusal to it to believe the majority of people who say they're not religious and so people are sort of seen as christian by default and so promoting and imposing a christian ethos on people is seen as kind of more neutral and fair um do you have a, a particular example of that um well, we recently wrote up some figures uh, from a survey of teachers, which is very interesting. It instantly showed, you know, a majority, a clear majority of teachers are supporting an end to new faith schools. Is this secondary, primary? Uh, this is across, across secondary and, and primary. We'll link it in the show notes. But wh- one of the the, uh, the less headline figures in that actually I found really interesting. And it was, uh, this is again a survey of, of, te- of school teachers in England. And it showed that 23% would find it acceptable for a child from a non-religious family to be allocated a place against their will at a Catholic school, but only 17% would find it acceptable for a Christian family to be allocated a place against their will at a Sikh school. So there's clearly this sort of religious hierarchy. If you're if you're a different religion, obviously having having certain religions imposed on you. Uh, so we we for example we, we helped a, a case where there were 20 families were assigned a place at a Sikh school against their wishes, and people sort of say, oh that's oh you know clearly that's wrong. You know, with examples with. Um, an Islamic family assigned a place at a Jewish Orthodox school, and people see clearly that's wrong. But then we had an example a few years ago with, um, uh, I think it was six families, they were assigned a C of E faith school against their wishes. And the attitude we then much saw there was like, you know, you know, as a Christian country, you should have to just put up with that. In fact, this leads on to my next question, which was going to be, what about parents of one religion being forced to send their children to a faith school of another religion? Is this is this an issue? But it's, it seems that... Um, there, there is a difference between um, the, the move from one religion to another as opposed to from non-religion to a religion. Yeah, I, and uh, it should be said that because there is uh, many uh, many families, if they're not religious, perceive, and in some cases accurately, that Christian faith schools are less aggressive uh, in promoting the ethos. They sometimes think, oh, you know, I'll be willing to put up with that. That doesn't seem as bad. Um, but it's certainly a growing issue, and that's because well, minority faith schools, uh, by which I mean uh, Sikh, Hindu, Islamic, uh, Jewish, and, and smaller Christian sects, they're even less popular among people who don't share the faith than other sort of the larger um, larger faith schools, which means they're very often likely to be undersubscribed. So if you've got an area where there's lots of where lots of schools are, are, are stretched for places, and you've got one minority faith school, uh, that's very un- very likely to undersubscribe. You know, it's much more likely that you might be as- might be end up being assigned there. So, for example, if you were a non-religious person in um, an area where the other schools were oversubscribed, you might end up being assigned to a Sikh school, for example. Yeah, and uh, that, uh, I think that's, uh, in terms of numerical, in single cases, I think uh, Sikh school is one of, the, one of the biggest examples. And uh, so you have these, these schools that just really are not attractive to people who don't, in any way, who don't share their faith. So you have either people travelling from a long way away, which you know disrupts the balance, uh, you know, of in other schools around the area. So people in other schools don't get to have Sikh friends in the program because there's a pressure for all the Sikh kids to go, to, you know, to this uh, one faith school. What is the National Secular Society doing to campaign against the insufficient provision of non-faith schools? I think research like this is is really important. Continuing to you know publish this quite groundbreaking report and then working every year to keep it up to date. Um, I think we're the only organisation that's actually publishing such estimates, you know, we're the only ones doing this uh, particular research. Um, on No More Faith Schools campaign and you know, the idea that we want to challenge any new faith school proposal is important there. The report contained a series of recommendations uh, for the DfE and for local authorities, and we've, you know, we continue to raise these issues uh, with local authorities and the Department for Education. Uh, we encourage them to monitor um, 
monitor these issues and to plan new schools to address them. Uh, this has set up a methodology uh, through this report. It's a methodology which allows us to provide some data when we're responding to consultations saying that uh, this uh, proposed new phase school is not necessary. Um, we've made recommendations which uh, require you know, a bit of policy change, a bit of change in thinking, and we've made other recommendations which do require legal changes which we need to campaign for and work for over time, uh, make it easier for a school community to downgrade or to remove a religious ethos to make the school more inclusive. Uh, we'd like there to be a secular entitlement of some sort, you know, at the minimum to have every child have the, the option of a community ethos school. And finally, what can people do if they're affected by this issue? Um, if you're affected by this issue, um, let us know if you uh, be linking the show notes uh, to our Choice Delusion page where there's a, a form to get in contact, uh, whether you have just you want to share your story of this experience or you're actively looking for some help with it. Uh, I'd encourage you to share the report with your MP. Um, all MPs received, received a copy of the report, but we have a template letter. So, you know, it's sending an email to them saying, here, this report is important. Take a look at it. It uh, helps uh, raise that back up their agenda. Um, support the No More Faith Schools campaign, particularly if there's a, a new faith school proposal in your area. And, um, maybe not less glamorous, but donate and become a member of the National Secular Society so uh, because research like this does take a lot of time and, and, and effort and uh, the ability to focus on issues so if you can support the NSS that's uh, really great and helps us to continue doing this into the future. Alistair Lichton, thank you very much. Cheers. That was episode 16 of the National Secular Society podcast hosted by Emma Park. If you would like to help us challenge religious privilege and support freedom of and from religion in Britain today, why not become a member of the NSS? Full details are on our website at secularism.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you like this podcast, you can find further episodes on the website, along with more information about the topics discussed. Thanks for listening.